as we continue our series going through the Sermon on the Mount, which is probably the most famous single message that Jesus ever gave. If you're following through, you might know what the next verses are, and there's some sensitive verses, some personal issues, family issues, marriage issues, sexuality issues. Some of you may want to leave now, I, but it's where you get in the verse. When you get there, you get there. And before I read what Jesus had to say, let me set the stage for you. Because if I set that stage about what was going on in the culture and the time that Jesus said it, and how he said it, you'll, you'll see just what a bombshell it would have been to those listening to the message. You see, the religious establishment in Jesus' day was firmly entrenched. It was the epicenter of culture. They were dictating everything that everyone does, and they were absolutely bound up in legalism do's and don'ts, rituals and practices, laws and codes. But it had absolutely nothing to do with the heart, with the inner world, their thought life, who they were when no one else was looking. In fact, they used their legalism to cover up a lot of bad behavior and make it seem like that behavior wasn't actually bad in the first place. They would find ways around the laws and the rules that they, they themselves had put into place in order that they could do whatever it was that they really wanted to do. So when it came to sexual misconduct, all that mattered to them, the religious leaders in that day, was that if you were married, you could not commit adultery. That was the one rule. That was it. For, for that one airtight rule, legalistically, keep it as legalistically as possible, and you were okay. Which meant that premarital sex, postmarital sex, lust, all of that went unchecked because all that mattered to the legal to the religious leaders in that day was keeping that one rule. Don't commit adultery. And they also carried that over to divorce. Since adultery was the one sin you had to avoid, they made it easy to avoid it by making it easy to divorce. In other words, is an easy way to get out of marriage so that you could then have sex with someone else. That way it wouldn't be adultery if you were no longer married. And all of this came at the expense of women who were treated in misogynistic ways and, and quite frankly, as second-class citizens. A man could divorce his wife with just a written notice. And I don't want to be married to you anymore kind of note. And that was it. And it could, it could be over anything. You could divorce a woman in Jesus' day because of a badly cooked meal. You could divorce a woman in Jesus' day simply because you found someone else who was more attractive. They made rules around the rules so that they could game the system. And the women in that day had no recourse. No defense. They were tossed aside into a social dung heap, left to fend for themselves as best they could. And as a divorced woman, few men would ever really want to marry them. So many of them ended up as beggars and forced into prostitution. Now, with that setting in mind, Jesus brings up all of these ideas in the Sermon on the Mount. Adultery, divorce, lust, oath-breaking, and, and he does it in a way that leaves the people saying, we've never heard anyone teach this way before. We've 
Never heard anybody say things like this before. It's going against everything our religious leaders have been telling us. So let's walk through what Jesus had to say. He begins Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28. And he says, You have heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Let's stop there for a moment because I can imagine the people in Jesus' day how far open their mouth had just dropped. Because Jesus begins by saying, you're right about adultery. It's bad. But you can't stop there. Let's talk about the lust that's behind it. The lust that drives someone into adultery. I mean, sure, you're patting yourself on the back for not breaking that one particular sexual rule. But you don't realize that any sexual act or thought that violates the sanctity of sex within marriage is adulterous. In Jesus' day, as in ours, just about everybody agreed that adultery in the strict sense of the word was a bad thing. But that's where they stopped. With adultery in the strict sense of the word. Anything else to them was fair game. For example, they told themselves that sex before marriage was okay because you weren't married. I mean, it's not like you're cheating on your spouse if you're not married, right? And then they said, and hey, if you're not married, but the other person is, well, that's not adultery either. Because you're not cheating on your spouse. They may be committing adultery, but you're okay because you're not married. And if you're divorced or widowed, you can pretty much do anything you want because it's not like you're going to lose your virginity or much less cheat on anybody. And even if you are married, you can engage in sexual thoughts and fantasies, even activity, as long as it's not actual intercourse. Because that action of adultery was all that matters, right? That's what they thought in Jesus' day. So Jesus jumped right into it and said, stop it. What you're saying, the rule that you're creating, it's insane. You're making a mockery out of more than I can count. You've heard that adultery is wrong, and what you heard is true, but you've missed the heart of God in all of this. What's destructive to your soul and everything that God has made you to be and to enjoy sexually is undermined, not simply by adultery in the technical sense, but adultery in the fullest sense. Anything outside of marriage not only violates the sanctity of marriage, and the place for sexual expression and fulfillment within that marriage, but it will violate you, and it will violate your relationship with God. So don't go into all your premarital, postmarital, she's married, but I'm not, which we didn't really go all the way. Don't, don't try and make up excuses. Don't try and find the loopholes. I'm telling you, to not even go as far as to giving in to lustful thoughts. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, let's be honest, that's impossible. But is it? You see, Jesus isn't talking about a passing glance or even appreciating the fact that someone is attractive. In fact, Jesus isn't even talking about sexual attraction because, let's be honest, we are sexual beings and we're going to find others sexually attractive. He's talking about that look of lust, 
that look that involves the desire, the fantasy of having sex with someone else, that look that feeds that inner sensual appetite, that left to itself, would give in to that desire and would leave the boundaries for which it was created. He's talking about that long, lingering look that takes it all in and gives yourself over to whatever sexual thoughts you're having. And I don't know about you, but I think that kind of lust is a choice. And it's a critical one at that. Because that is where sexual sin begins. That beginning, it's so strong, so real, so decisive that it's as if you've already gone to bed with them when you get there. When Jesus, what Jesus is saying is that that thought is the first part of the act. It's not innocent. It's not to be made light of. Treat that first look as if it was the act itself and resist it with every, every ounce of energy and resolve that you have. Because sexual sin is more than just the final act of intercourse. The act itself, it's the culmination of an infection that was allowed to spread into your heart and into your soul. Things like adultery, they don't just happen they begin. You end up in bed with somebody mentally and emotionally long before you ever end up with somebody end up in bed with somebody physically. Having said that, Jesus then gives them some practical advice about how they should live. He says, "If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away." It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, obviously, Jesus isn't talking about actually gouging out your eyes or cutting off your hands. Although several years ago, I remember reading a case where an individual did just that. It was a young man. He was using drugs, probably. You guessed that a little bit, maybe. Um, who gouged out his eyes and cut off his hands because he was having impure thoughts and he didn't want to act upon it, so he took the Bible literally here. But that's, that's not what Jesus is saying here. What Jesus is saying is that whatever causes us to engage in sex in ways that does not honor ourselves, honor others, or honors God should be dealt with radically. Whatever it is that's feeding our thought life, feeding our imagination, causing us to engage in that first step of lust in our hearts should be dealt with severely, swiftly, and dramatically. It's not worth it. The stakes are too high. So let's get specific and talk about the two points that Jesus pinpoints for us to look at are our eyes and our hands. And I'm going to begin with our eyes. What are you looking at that's causing you to engage in sexual sin within your heart, setting you up to act that out in your life? We all know what I'm talking about. Every month, pornographic websites receive more traffic than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. Let that sink in for a moment. More than one out of every three internet downloads, porn-related. At, at least a third of all data, all data transferred across the internet is related to pornography. Globally, porn is estimated to be a $97 billion industry. Billion with a B. 
in 2016, more than 4.5 billion hours of pornography was consumed on the large, world's largest porn site. One site. On that one site, more than 4.5 billion hours was consumed. And that particular site outranks the likes of eBay, MSN, and Netflix. Right now, almost seven out of every 10 young people, between the ages of 13 and 24, seven out of 10 of them actively view pornography every single day. You know what that's doing to you? Don't tell me it's not doing, having any impact on you. That's not intellectually honest, it's not sexually honest, and it's not spiritually honest. It's leading you to sexualize every single person you come into contact with, every relationship, and every situation. It's undermining whatever your relationship you're currently in. It doesn't help your marriage sexually. In fact, it's been proven to undermine sexual relationships within a marriage. People who admit to having an extramarital affair were 300% more likely to admit consuming porn than if they didn't have it. Pornography causes affairs. Most divorces have Adultery is part of it. Most divorces happen because an affair has often been revealed, whether currently or in the past. Or maybe it was an emotional affair that surfaces or an attraction develops. But some kind of sexual misconduct. And almost every divorce has some type of marital unfaithfulness as a component. So Jesus gets drastic. He says, gouge it out from the start. Deal with any and all lust immediately and decisively. Don't let your eyes do that to you. Do whatever it takes to cut it off. So how do you do that? And I'll tell you right now how, you're, how you should do that, but you're probably not going to like it. it. It's going to, for some of you, it might feel like gouging your eye out. It might be easier to go that route. If you have an issue with this, become an accountability partner with someone else and then use accountability software so that any sketchy website you may go to gets reported to them. That'll clean what you look at up pretty quick. There are actually free programs that do this, programs like Covenant Eyes. There's actually one called Triple X Church, which is a horrible name, but it's, you get the point. Just pick one of these programs and then pick a partner and start sharing with each other. We, and I'll say we, we men, seem to think that we can be strong enough to overcome this on our own. You say, I don't, I don't need to do that. You know, that's a sign of weakness. I'm strong enough for that. If that's your thought, then come talk to me, and we'll go out to coffee sometime because I, you are clearly more spiritual than I am and I'd like to learn from you. you. You must have a closer walk with Jesus than I do because we're all sinful human beings. If you think that admitting that and, and getting an accountability partner is a sign of weakness, I think it's a sign of strength. I think it's a sign of strength that you know that there's a vulnerability there and you're willing to, to step up and make sure that you don't ever go down that path. And then Jesus also talked about our hands. In other words, the things that you do in your life, 
how you live and order your life. And let's, we can get a little specific here too, and let me ask the question, are you a flirt? If I went to the people that you hung out with outside of church, and I asked them, would they say you were a flirt? Do you dress to be attractive, which there's nothing wrong with, or do you dress to attract? There's a big difference between those two. Do you watch out how and when you're alone with the opposite sex? How do you handle yourself when you're on a travel for business? What about long lunches with people of the opposite sex? Staying late to work on a project? Are you talking negatively about your marriage with someone of the opposite sex? The point is, again, that you can't take on lust by yourself and win. That's what Jesus is trying to get across here. You have to take concrete, specific, sometimes even drastic measures. You need to ruthlessly evaluate your life and make whatever changes are necessary to protect yourself. Which brings us to what Jesus had to say next. It says, It has been said, that anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a woman so divorced commits adultery. Jesus right here drops another bombshell on the people of his day and our day as well. Jesus took on the easy divorce culture of his day. And if we're honest, it's a pretty easy divorce culture in our day, too. He says, You are so concerned about the letter of the law dealing with adultery. Not only are you violating that with your unchecked lust, but you are violating that with the way that you are treating marriage itself. When you divorce your wife for any and every little thing and throw her it out, into trying to find another marriage, you are causing her to commit adultery. And when you remarry, you are committing adultery because you should have never been divorced in the first place. You may have some legal certificate in your hand saying that it was legal to get divorced, but it wasn't from God's hand. God didn't sign it. Now, there's a lot there to unpack because, if we're honest, there's a lot of confusion about what the Bible really has to say about divorce. So let me give you the specific teaching of Jesus on divorce. It is, divorce is usually wrong. Now, there are two key words in that. Usually and wrong. I'm going to look at the wrong part first. Jesus says, I know you have heard that it's okay to divorce each other, but I'm telling you that when you do, you're going against God's law. And if there is a remarriage following a wrongful divorce, you're committing adultery. Because in God's eyes, it was a violation of the marriage covenant that you entered into. God instituted marriage as a permanent union. From the very beginning, God intended marriage to be a lifelong commitment to truly become one. Glued together, inseparable, the marriage covenant agreement is for life. So divorce is usually wrong. But then we have to look at that word Usually, because he says that divorce can occasionally be right, and upon those occasions, remarriage would not be considered adultery. 
if the divorce isn't wrong, then the remarriage wouldn't be wrong. So the question begs is, when, it is, when is a divorce allowed or even called for? And the Bible gives us two situations. One that isn't detailed here, but it is in other parts of the Bible, and that has to do with physical abandonment. And that's when someone leaves you and, quite frankly, refuses to stay married to you. It's also if their behavior is, is of such a nature that it forces separation. That could be illegal behavior such as drug use or it could be physical abuse meaning that you need to separate yourself for your safety or for the safety of your children. Then in that situation that partner is forcing you to leave, to separate. It's a form of physical abandonment. And the other situation which we do see here is mentioned here by Jesus, and it's the case of marital unfaithfulness. The words marital unfaithfulness can seem pretty broad. I mean, you could almost put anything under that terminology, couldn't you? Not really. You see, the words marital unfaithfulness under the original language, is different. I mean, you could say under that a bunch of different things, such as, you didn't provide for me financially. Is that marital unfaithfulness? He got fat and isn't attracted to me anymore. Some people could say that's marital unfaithfulness, but the gener it's not as general of a phrase as you think. That actual Greek word that Jesus used that we translate unfaithful was not unfaithful in a general sense, but in a very specific sense. That word is, ironically enough, porneia, where we get pornography. It refers to flagrant and habitual sexual immorality without any desire to repent and to be faithful. So sexual intimacy within the marriage is so sacred, so profound, that it's to be protected. And it's of such a spiritual significance that its violation is enough in God's eyes to end the marriage. No other human activity has that same power as sexual intimacy. It's the supreme expression of a relationship. It's the ultimate emotional unity. So when the marriage is defiled by that oneness being violated through sexual activity with someone else outside of the marriage, it so destroys the very fabric of the relationship that Jesus says divorce is allowed. That's how serious and how wonderful and how amazing and how powerful and how special sex is. And how tied, how tied it is to intimacy and trust. If it is violated, the marriage is violated. It, it's torn apart. So he says divorce is usually wrong unless there is habitual sexual immorality, or your spouse leaves you, in the, or there is the kind of behavior on the part of your spouse that would force you to flee from the marriage. God never meant a marriage relationship to take those kinds of hits. God never meant for someone's heart to sustain those kinds of blows that kind of treachery, that degree of sin and degradation. Now, God does not require divorce in those situations. He merely allows it. If at all possible, you would want to try to work through, if possible, 
Because God, even in those situations, he's not happy about divorce. But he realizes that sometimes it's necessary. Which brings us to the final thing that Jesus had to say in this portion. And it's a portion that a lot of people miss. And they think it has to do with something else, because I cannot get on that particular slide. There we go. Um, it says, you have heard that it was said, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all. Simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Most of the time when you read this, it's taken out of the context of the Sermon on the Mount. And, we're, and most people think it has to do with testifying in court. But you have to look at the context. This immediately follows what Jesus is talking about, divorce. It's the final strike of the hammer that Jesus gives them. Jesus wants all that legalism, all that game playing to, to be put aside. When it comes to the most important human relationship you will ever steward, which is your marriage, it's not about a legal contract. It's not about technical oaths or prenuptial agreements. This is about who you are as a person before the living God and the person with whom you are marrying. This isn't about an oath. And that's, this is about every fiber of your being, every ounce of your character, every inch of your determination and resolve saying yes to that relationship. is isn't about courts of law or contracts or agreements, which is where it's usually taken out of context and used. It's about what I've purposed in my heart and will keep purposing until the day I die. My yes on my marriage relationship means yes. That's why in a Christian marriage, it's not about marriage oaths, but it is an exchange of marriage vows. And there's a difference there. The giving and exchanging of your word, and the words that we use often are, are specific, aren't they? Through sickness and in health. For richer or poorer, in good times or in bad till death do us part. Jesus said, let your yes to that be yes, or don't get married. So you see it's in that context. You can understand how these things that Jesus was saying to them about lust and sexual sin and adultery and divorce and oath-breaking were awkward uncomfortable and convicting. It might be that way today, talking about it, especially if you didn't know I was going to talk about this. You probably would have thought, if I would have known that's what he was going to talk about today, I would have stayed at home. That's why you got to read the next couple verses in the Sermon on the Mount. You know what's coming. So let me give you three words. Three words when I deal with this. The first word is to do exactly what Jesus said to do. Whatever it is that you need to stop, stop. If you've given yourself over to lust and pornography, if you've engaged in sexual activity outside of marriage, if you're living together, if you're having an affair, stop. You're better than that. You deserve better than that. Your current or future spouse deserves better than that. And most of all, God deserves better than that. And you can stop. You can turn things around. No one will cheer you on more than God himself. No one will rally at your side more than this church will. 
And no one will have your back as you try to do that more than I will. Stop sinning sexually against yourself, against others, and against God. Get an accountability partner. End the affair. If you're living together, separate or get married. We will help if you ask us. Don't divorce wrongly. And I don't know what you need to stop, but whatever it is, stop it. The second word is forgiveness. For those of you who have fallen into the snare of pornography, you've, maybe you've made a lot of sexual mistakes, maybe you've divorced wrongfully, you need to know you can be forgiven. Don't let anybody make you feel that every other sin is forgivable except the sexual ones. Don't let anybody try to tell you that divorce is like a scarlet letter that you wear on, the ch on your chest the rest of your life. That's not true. God's word says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and he will forgive us of our sins. So however you've lived outside of God's perfect will for your life, seek God's forgiveness. And then begin making him the Lord of the marriage you're currently in. Be committed to that relationship with the commitment that God has designed for his followers. Which brings me to the third word, and it is commitment. If I could talk to every married couple who are struggling, and particularly if I could talk to those who are just starting off, and if, if I could tell them to please put Christ at the center of their marriage, I would have one other big mentoring idea for them. I would let them know that marriage is not built on a set of circumstances. It's not built on emotion. There is one and only one foundation to marriage, and it's commitment. Commitment is a choice. There will be times when you're angry at your wife. There will be times that your husband is anything but sensitive. There will be times when you feel betrayed. And when you wonder whether there might be someone else out there who would make you happier. And it's then, at those times, that everything is on the line. Because it's then that you are either committed to that marriage or you're not. You see, there is no pain like an unhappy marriage. When Amy and I have gone through difficult seasons, and yes, we have, that pain can be about as bad as it gets. That pain and ache that you feel can almost be unbearable. It dominates your life. It dominates your world. It makes you an emotional wreck. Some of you right now that's where you're at. You're in a troubled marriage, and you don't want a divorce, but the alternative is for things to stay the way they currently are. And you don't know, you don't, you don't know if you can go on for another year or five or 10 or 20 at this rate. If it was just you slugging it out, dealing with it on your own, I could understand that point. But it's not just you. There's a God on the loose, and don't sell him short. There is no marital problem so great that he can't solve. You may be thinking, if our marriage makes it, it'll be a miracle. Well, good. Because God is in the miracle business. And rumor has it, that's his specialty. 
So if your marriage is on the rocks, give God a chance. I have never seen a marriage fail where both people get down on their knees and hold each other's hands and look up to God and say, help. Never. I've seen them fall apart when one of them is standing up saying, screw this, while the other one is praying. So if your marriage is on the rocks, give God a chance. Resolve in your heart to be faithful to that commitment, faithful to that vow. I once read of three mountain climbers who were preparing to climb Mount Everest the first two who were interviewed had extensive skill and enormous physical endurance. When asked if they would make it to the top of Everest, they both answered that they felt like they might, that they had a, a decent chance. Then the third man, who was a small and unskilled climber, answered it completely differently. When asked if he would complete the climb to the top of Everest, he said simply but firmly, I will. Of the three of those climbers, he was the only one who made it. So stop, be forgiven, and be committed until death do you part.